From Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, this is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Back in the day, with your Walter Cronkites and David Brinkleys, it felt kind of inappropriate for an interviewer to bring their full selves to the conversation. It was all about the guest, after all, so why bother bringing your own distinctive flair? But now, people tune in as much for the interviewer as the one being interviewed. And because of that, the experience feels much more authentic. So today, you'll get to know three singular interviewers who each have their own distinct but oh-so-compelling styles of asking tough, thought-provoking questions. You'll hear how the mononymous Z-Way uses shockingly direct questions, often about race and identity, for comedy. And legendary interviewer and former Connecticut news anchor Gail King shares insights about how to interview people who've been through difficult experiences. But first, we'll start with Mehdi Hassan. He's the host of The Mehdi Hassan Show on Peacock, and his latest book is called Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Whether you're in politics, finance, entertainment, or any field whatsoever, if you come onto his show, you'd better be prepared. Mehdi and his team are known for having all of the receipts. He never shies away from an argument and makes a point to hold politicians and public figures to account. And much to the chagrin of his guests, he loves to win. So I wondered, how much was little kid Mehdi exactly like he is now at 44? Seven-year-old Mehdi was it was indeed exactly like uh, sadly 44-year-old Mehdi, with the difference that probably seven-year-old Mehdi enjoyed to argue, debate, and question, but probably didn't do as much preparation and hard work as 44-year-old Mehdi. But I was the kid. Uh, who you see in the movies and the TV shows, who says, but why? But why? But why? You know, won't take the first answer from the parents uh, for granted, always has a follow-up. Even as a child, uh, I was obsessed with follow-up questions. See, when I think about the work I do, my my focus is to get people to talk about their feelings, about what they've been through. And most people are into that, otherwise they wouldn't agree to the show. But you have an intimidating, to some, offer when you ask a guest to join how do you navigate that? Like when someone's like, I'm not quite sure if I'm up for this task. Do you and your teams try to convince them to come or is it uh, something else? It's a great question. Well, in terms of kind of the intimidating this, when I moved to the Washington DC area from the UK about eight years ago, I, I ended up befriending a bunch of people who knew of me from my days in the UK, my days working for Al Jazeera English internationally. And, and a lot of the responses, thankfully, were, oh, wow, you're not as intimidating in person as we thought you were. So I think the TV face probably doesn't help me. I write in my book about how the fact that I have RAMF, which I call resting angry Muslim face, which doesn't really help me uh, as a male Muslim in the media interviewing people because I look angrier than I am uh, sometimes. Uh, so it is a challenge uh, to get certain people on the show. Um, with the people who don't want to come on, the case I, I always make and my I, my producers always make is, look, we are tough, but we are fair. Uh, you will get tougher questions on my show than you'll get elsewhere, but you also get more time. Uh, you'll get, you know, we, we do extended longer interviews than most folks do, which guests like often. And, um, you know, it's a challenge for the guest. A lot of the appeal for a lot of people is they like it, you know, especially people on the political right uh, enjoy a bit of an argument. And, you know, the most recent bout I had on my own uh, MSNBC streaming show on Peacock was with Vivek Ramaswamy, the Republican presidential candidate. And in that case, people are surprised when I tell them he volunteered to come on the show. We didn't invite him. He challenged me on Twitter. He said, why don't you have me on? And I said, OK. Um, and we had him on and it didn't go so well for him, but it was his choice to come on the show. In 2010, you made $750,000. You had the money to pay for law school. You didn't need a Soros affirmative action scholarship that you now yeah, criticize. I mean, if, none of this is worthy, but if you think it is, let's get to the detail. That was well, actually I, the I, first big piece you say you're anti affirmative action. Was, well, you took a scholarship for immigrants. I'm anti affirmative action. So why'd you take a scholarship so which, for the children which of immigrants? Which falsehood would you like me to address? The financial one or the or the one about my views on affirmative did, action? Because I can go in whichever not, order you'd like. On the financial piece of it. Not at, not at the time that I had applied for the scholarship yes, you did. that fall. Yes, you did. December. Yes, you did, Vivek. Decem this, Mehdi, is, this is awkward for you because you me, did. I've got the tax returns in front no, of my face. No, it's not awkward for you. Yes, on December 31st, when the application for the scholarship... Was when people agree to come on the show and they show up, I know you have a finely attuned sense of emotion vibration presence 
if somebody shows up to be on your show and they come across as fearful, nervous, does that affect how you treat them? <laughs> I guess it depends who it is. Uh, context matters, right? So if it's a GOP presidential candidate and they're nervous because of something I've asked them, that means I'm doing my job. That's a good thing, right? If Vivek Ramaswamy looks deer in the headlights because I've got his tax returns in my hands that he didn't expect me to have, then that's great. I'm doing my job. And it's it's all fair in love and war and interviews. Um, if it's, you know, if it's not someone who's traditionally a public figure, you know, I've interviewed quote unquote real people. I've interviewed, you know, victims of trauma and, and people whose partners or family members have died. Um, you know, that's a very different situation, obviously. There you're trying to help the interviewee uh, just have the best possible conversation uh, without exploiting them or without disrespecting them. So it depends where and when you are in that situation. It does amuse me when people turn out to be nervous, not because they know who I am, but because they don't know who I am. And that's happened to me a few times where people just don't prepare. And I, in, in my book, Win Every Argument, I have a whole chapter on, you know, do your homework, prepare, prepare, prepare. And it's amazing how many people in public life don't prepare for something as important as a live TV interview, for example. I interviewed the vice president of a country, I won't say which one, uh, a few years back when I was at Al Jazeera English, and I could hear them, their mic was open and they were saying to their assistant, so who's this person, what's this show? We're about to start the interview and now you're asking that question? Like That's a bit late in the day. Mm, yeah. I wonder how much when you are preparing for a debate or an interview, which are sometimes one and the same, you know, you've done all this research and your team's done all this research. And so you're pretty solid about how you feel considering what you know to be true. But I also would like to hear about how you feel when you are humbled, be it on in front of a live audience or in your personal life. I think for some people being humbled is like an attack. And for some people being humbled is like a dopamine hit. Where do you lie in that? Well, look, I wrote a book called Win Every Argument. So obviously I'm not a person who likes losing. Let's just be very honest and blunt about that. And that goes back to my childhood. That goes back to playing board games with my kids. They know I don't spare them. Uh, but look, the reality is that there are lessons in life and, you know, uh, experience is everything. And there is a quote in the book from a BBC presenter who interviewed uh, Kanye West back when he was Kanye, uh, who, who, who has this line, like, you win some or you learn. And I think that is the right philosophy, that even when you lose, you have to turn that into some kind of personal victory. And the best way to do that is to say, all right, what did I get wrong? How did I lose? How can I do better next time? So when I interview someone, I remember uh, interviewing a Turkish minister uh, back in the day after the attempted coup in Turkey and the crackdown on dissenters. And I came with, I had all my stuff, the human rights reports and all that. And I went for him and he was super smooth, super slick, smiling, just kind of dodged any kind of uh, zinger question that I thought I may have. Or, and I remember thinking afterwards, yeah, he he totally won that. He totally came out of that exchange on top. No one will watch that interview and think, oh, man, he got him or maybe held him to account. Why is that? And that, that for me makes me go and reflect. And my team and I will sit down and say, all right, what do we get wrong? What can we do better next time? Where did we mess up? What did we not see? Where were we too arrogant or complacent? Uh, and that is the attitude I take. Otherwise, I would just have to go wallow. <laughs> Which isn't the worst thing. Um, who have you not yet interviewed that when you think about doing it, you salivate? That is a good question. That is a good question. Um, well, the question I always get asked is, would you interview Donald Trump? And what would happen with Donald Trump? And I, my answer to that question always is, obviously, I, you know, I couldn't, I don't think I could turn down and interview Donald Trump, but it wouldn't last longer than two minutes is the reality. Like, he would get up and walk out within like a minute or two of my question and realizing where I'm coming from. So it wouldn't actually be a sustained interview. Um, I like a challenge, right? People think I enjoy dunking on people, but actually I enjoy an intellectual I enjoy, you know, the very first TV interview I did, which kickstarted my career as a TV interviewer back in 2012 was with Richard Dawkins, the scientist, famous atheist. And it was in front of a live audience in Oxford and it was for Al Jazeera. And it was really, really interesting because the guy, as much as I disagree with him, is clearly an intellect, a public intellectual. And it was really interesting back and forth on a very thorny issue of faith and God and organized religion. Before we go any further, I just want to check something. Are you an atheist? For all practical purposes, yes. You, uh, nobody can actually say for certain that anything doesn't exist. But I'm an atheist in the same way as I'm an a-leprechaunist and an a-fairyist and an a-pig-unicornist. 
So you're not 100% sure God doesn't exist, but you're sure enough to make it practically... I'm as sure as you are sure that fairies and leprechauns don't exist. And do you see an equivalence between the idea of God and the idea of a fairy and a leprechaun? The evidence for both is equally poor. <laughs> so when I think about, like, who would I like to interview, I mean, someone for me, as a Brit, as someone who moved here from the United Kingdom and who became politically radicalized, if you can use that phrase, during the Iraq war. Tony Blair is always someone on my list of someone I, I would love to be able to interview because as much as I loathe his politics and what he did, clearly a very smart, eloquent guy. It would, and no one's really able been able to lay a glove on him in interviews. I think John Stewart weirdly did on The Daily Show about a decade ago, but most interviewers, he kind of beats them. So that's the challenge and appeal. I think right now in American politics, it would be fun just to sit down with Ron DeSantis because I feel like Ron DeSantis is so prickly, so defensive, but so so many kind of open goals um it would be that would be a furious exchange but again like trump would he just walk out after two minutes we have a real problem now where you know conservative politicians can retreat to their safe spaces on right-wing television so they don't have to submit to tough interviews now i don't endorse any sort of like violent or painful restraint but if trump had some very gentle handcuffs with furry bits inside so he wasn't being hurt or anything so he had to stay put and he had to stay put i mean there's <laughs> What would you want to get out of him? It's a whole platter of things you could talk about. What would be the one thing you would hope you would get him to say? Well, it's, it's a great question because my philosophy of interview Trump would be one thing. The problem with Trump interviews in general is that, you know, understandably, the interviewer wants to ask about lots of things. This is the former president of the United States. There's multiple stories. And he's involved in multiple controversies, whether it's abortion, whether it's his four criminal indictments, whether it's, uh, you know, his incitement of violence, whether it's his anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera. And just doesn't work on someone like Trump, because I have a whole chapter in the book uh, about beware the gish galloper. Uh, and the gish galloper in debate circles is a person who overwhelms you, uh, beats you down with nonstop lies at, at, at rapid fire and doesn't allow you to respond to all of them, just kind of floods the zone with BS, to borrow a line from one of Trump's former advisors. And I think they're, therefore the only way to really interview Trump is to pick one topic and not and not much, because he thrives on the interviewer moving on or going on to the next subject or not getting into depth. He can't handle depth, right, because he's a truly superficial person. So it's, I would just stick to one topic in detail, have one question, two questions, and like 10 follow-ups. And I think that would really be problematic for him because no one's ever really done it. And separately, just on a more lighter note, I've always wanted to do an interview with Trump where you just ask him fact questions. Like, what does NATO stand for? <laughs> what is the price of milk? What's the capital of France? And just see what he does, because I don't think he can answer any of those questions. I would listen to that. In terms of interviewing and this particular focus that I'm having you join me on, did I miss anything? Is there anything else you want to add? Maybe for those who um, are budding interviewers or in, in debate and they're like, I don't know, any sort of advice, anything at all open floor. The one thing I would say, especially on the American media scene, when it comes to doing interviews is there is an awkwardness to asking certain questions, whether it is uh, a Gail King or an Oprah Winfrey asking that kind of very personal question that some celeb has never been asked before, or whether it's someone like myself who does more adversarial journalism with politicians who's saying to a John Bolton, for example, as I did, how do you sleep at night with all this blood on your hands? People don't ask those questions because they think, oh, I'm seeing an invisible line, bit awkward, bit in your face. And there is an awkwardness there. And that is why people kind of end up doing softer interviews that I'd like them to do. And I would say the only way to get over that awkwardness is to do it, is just to do it. And that's why preparation is so important. Like practice is so important. Whether it's public speaking, I always say start with five people before you start with 500 or 5,000 people. Same thing with interviews. You know, do, do ask your blunter questions on the smaller scale with the lower level person before you get to the president of the United States. And I think that's so important because let's, we're all human beings. It is very hard, no matter what the politics of the situation is, to get in someone's face. We, you know, we have social norms. We don't want to, you don't want to upset someone. You don't want to be rude to someone, especially if someone's a guest on your show. It's like having a guest in your house. And you've got to overcome that because otherwise people who need to be held accountable won't be held accountable. And I think you just got you just need to acknowledge it exists and you've got to push through. Mehdi Hassan, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you for having me. When we get back, the unparalleled interview style of Z-Way. I think there's a part of my audience that watches interviews and thinks, I can't believe this is happening. And then there's a portion of my audience that watches the interviews and thinks, this has happened to me exactly before. 
And we connect with Connecticut treasure, Gail King. I believe any question can be asked. You just have to have the right time, the right tone, and the right place. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Stay with me. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today, we're getting to know three very different interviewers. In a little bit, you'll hear from the legendary Gail King about her storied career. But first, the extraordinary comedian, actor, and writer, Z-Way, who goes by just her first name. If you've seen Z-Way on her eponymous Showtime series or YouTube show, Baited, then your heart might be racing right now. But if you haven't heard her direct interviewing style... I believe in using humor as a tool to shed light on the truth. But there are some issues that are too sensitive to joke about. What bothers you more, slow walkers or racism? You have a book called Pretty Powerful. Why do you think ugly people can't be powerful? Are you a racist? My face is blurred for this, right? How many times have you said the N-word? The A or the E-R? Who do you want to represent less, immigrants or gay people? You have made me feel so empowered. Well, the interview's not over. There is truly no interviewer quite like Z-Way. I asked her the same first question I asked Mehdi. How much did young Z-Way resemble the person she is today? That's a great question. I I honestly refer back to my my five-year-old self when I'm when I feel lost creatively. Like what was what did that kid enjoy? And so I remember I was a really well-behaved child, honestly. Like I was the kid at every restaurant that parents would look over and be like, wow, your kid is so well behaved. But then at home, I would be like, I would throw talent shows for myself and make my family watch. Um, Obviously they didn't want to, but I kind of like held them hostage in that sense. So I was both like a public, like goody two shoes and like a private ham. See, I wonder when I was raised, my mom, she, every time I would ask her a question, like what this word means or whatever, she would get so excited and she would answer it with respect and love. Like, finally, my daughter wants to know something, but it was over and over again. And so I was raised in a household where asking questions made my mom happy and I wanted okay. to make my mom happy. Yeah. What was, what was it like as you, as, as I imagine an inquisitive child, how was that held? That's a great question. I, hmm, I, I've always asked a lot of questions as well, but I remember being very nosy and I I honestly, like I am and was an information sponge. So I watched a lot of daytime talk shows. You're five years old. It's like, I watched a lot of Regis and Kathy Lee. And then I would just remember like, okay, they, to this episode, they met with a surgeon and like, you have to wear um, sunscreen because 90% 90% of Americans, you know, and I would retain all of that information even as a young child. And so that was more where the curiosity came from was that I, I have a really good memory with facts um, and hist- history specifically. And so I, I, my parents really encouraged that and like would buy me history books all the time. And we'd watch like old time movies um, about history. And yeah, that was something that was really encouraged. Just a love of history. And you've talked about how, as a child, white people would bring up race in a conversation without any prompting. Can you talk about how that pattern became a part of what you're so well known for now? I think that my interview style is so awkward in part because I would find myself in really deeply awkward conversations in high school and college and wish that there was a camera on me to to understand like, okay, this is not just in my head. Like I just remember specifically one time talking to someone in school and they just randomly brought up like their nanny being black. And I was like, why would you bring that up? I, what, and, but she meant well, it was just like a word vomit for whatever reason she was uncomfortable. Um, and so that was, that's probably one of the like origins to my like superhero story (laughs) is just like not being able to shake people bringing up really random things to me and then like turning that into comedy. When I think about white people talking to you about race and racism, you know, I'm not, I'm a white woman, so I don't know what this is like, but I also imagine that there's a certain, like, why me? Like, what do you think, 
this is not my job to work this through with you. It's not your job to work it through with anybody. But now it's almost like you're you're leaning into like, all right, well, if we're going to do this, let's do it. Yeah, I definitely think chaos reigns. I think there's a part of my audience that thinks that watches interviews and thinks I can't believe this is happening. And then there's a portion of my audience that watches the interviews and thinks this has happened to me exactly before. Do you feel like in a way, you know, you are Z way you are speaking for, as one person, you're, you're not representing anybody, but at the same time, like you have this, this at this point expectation to be talking about race when it, you know, when it comes up. And so in a way it's like, all right, well, if I'm going to be at the helm of this, like, I want to dig in deep. And there's something that feels empowering, frankly, for everybody I'm seeing on the screen. So what's your question? <laughs> Sorry. That's a, <laughs> that's a good question. What's my question? Is that is that right? Does it feel empowering to be doing this and having these conversations? Or does what are the other feelings around it? Oh, that's a good question. I think... As I started off as a writer and what you learn as a writer is like specificity helps to have universal connection, right? If you're really specific about the character and their universe that they're able to connect to a wider audience. And so I find that in me sharing specific examples from my life or like using those examples to create my art, I'm able to connect with a wide audience. So it's empowering in that I feel seen. I feel like, okay, this isn't just in my head. Like, wow, I'm not just like losing my mind. Actually, people can all relate to these weird conversations or like the tension they feel about whether or not they should answer or not answer. So that is the empowering element. Like it's less about me trying to start a movement and more about me trying to move myself. Those moments when you toss out a question or you sort of uh, dangle something in front of someone to sort of get them to go deeper into what they're saying. In those uncomfortable moments, are you uncomfortable? What's going on in you? Yes, I'm deeply uncomfortable. I think you can see it in my face, I, but I kind of am, I am at peace with sitting through discomfort. Um, that's just like being human. I wouldn't, but also even thinking like wider, do people feel comfortable in interviews? ever unless they're like a hyper narcissist who has <laughs> written every answer like isn't the point of an interview to explore therefore like i don't think i i understand that what that the way that i approach interviews is radical because of my identity but i watch real housewives and every question andy cohen asked these girls is like so like you got a nose job what's that about and <laughs> isn't that unco deeply uncomfortable and you really don't get the same fear and provocation when it comes to him or Howard Stern or Colbert and his your, but it's the same genre. Even like when you think about Oprah and her most classic, she asks really, really wild questions like, are you silent or were you silenced? That is, how do you answer that without discomfort? But that's what makes her so sensational. So really, I'm just like, I am another like tent pole in this like long storied history of American journalism. I just happen to have a comedy background. So that's how I approach it. When I think about what this job as an interviewer, as an interviewer does for me, like, I can't imagine not doing it now. And I'll do this work for the rest of my life one way or the other. Like, I feel in some ways that this work has formed me. I've always been really curious, and now I have an outlet for it. Do you feel the same? I don't think that this work has formed me. I think I have formed work around my around how I behave they say that like if something comes easy to you do it for your for a living and that's really how I feel like I ask questions I'm curious and so I will do this for the rest of my life but because it's easy versus when you're like there are other elements of my job and it's like oh gosh <laughs> like okay let me sit down and write <laughs> for writing four hours oh you know like and i love writing but it it's it's a labor of love versus interviewing is like it doesn't feel like labor to me when you think about the people who are best at being interviewers you'd mentioned oprah oprah is the best american interviewer hot take 
She, because of the format that she, I think that she revolutionized the sensational interview. I, and she's so good at it. She made a billion dollars. I think Oprah, I think Howard Stern is also a fantastic interviewer. And Andy Cohen comes from that, that like uh, school of thought. But yeah, I think that those two are pretty good. What would you like to get better at as an interviewer? Ooh, what would I like to get better at as an interviewer? That's a, I don't know. What do you want to get better at as an interviewer? I would like to get better at being more in the moment. You know how you have your whole list of questions and you kind of jump around and that's fine. Hmm. But I feel like oftentimes I'm holding like, how do I want this to flow while being while actively listening to the person and, and being co completely engaged with them. So sometimes I'm not as present as I'd like. And I think the more present I can be, the more organic the conversation can feel. A hundred percent. I definitely think present being present is like one of the most important things about interviewing. Um, I think so. I'm going to say something, but I don't know if I should actually get better at it, but I I definitely care about my guests <laughs> as problematic as they are. I, I approach them as humans because I research them so intensively and you're like learning their hopes and dreams. And it's, I like, I don't want anything bad to happen to them, even though I don't want anything bad to happen to them. And so obviously they say in like documentary, you don't want to, you don't want to mess with the subject. You allow them to exist and just like consider them in plain sight. And then the viewer must make their own opinion. And I want, I don't know if it would make me a better interviewer if I had less of an emotional investment in people not being miserable um, and not being, and being okay. But I definitely think that I've gotten that advice before, but I don't agree with it. So that's not a real answer to you, but it's definitely a critique I've gotten is that sometimes I can be a little soft or handholdy, even though I'm accused of being, um, you know, brass. One of the other guests on this episode is going to be Gail King. And yeah, I, I love Gail. She loves you too, by the way. I love Gail. And she, we were talking about like, her interest is in getting straight answers from people. That is that is her focus. That is her job. She does all the research. Just give me a straight answer. Ne ask until you figure, until it's clear. You have that objective, it seems, as well. But you also are, you're also like trying to get this to be funny, you know? And so I'd love to hear about what's going on in your brain and the rest of you as you're trying to get straight answers, answers from people, but you're also like, this is a comedy show. Oh yeah. I mean, what's interesting is I, I guess you could say I'm trying to get, I ask direct questions. I don't know if I want straight answers I get, or is straight fluid in this case, because I'm there's, there's like the factual truth and then there's emotional truth. And I think that my work predicates on emotional truth, right? So you take my interview with Alyssa Milano, I ask her any question. I'm um, like, wait, so what, what, what's the race of your therapist? And she might give like a very long, like me and, during answer and we never actually get to the point of the question and that is a perfectly like functional interview to me because it really isn't about what her answer is it's more about what she feels compelled to say in this moment right so that that's probably where the comedy comes in is that facts especially in this era god bless it facts have a loose <laughs> a tenuous relationship to entertainment. And so like what fact, the fact is not as compelling in this space to me as what you're trying to convey about yourself in this conversation that is public. Um, and so you see that crossover with my IG live to my Showtime show to whatever iteration I do next. But if I was like on CBS morning and it was Gail King and I was, you know, a proper journalist, then you, you, you have to be motivated by fact. Otherwise you get a huge lawsuit and, you know, um, society as we know it would collapse, but I am a comedy show. So I'm not as concerned with that as I am with just like, so tell me about like the PT cruiser that you got when you were a kid like sure let's go down this road because you're unpacking something let's let's deal with it which is probably also why I feel like a weird connection to my guests is because we're um, unpacking constantly and that's what we're creating this art together like it's not just me um they are they I could not exist without them bringing whatever they have to the table 
Yeah, and you're talking about vulnerable things. You're asking them to say things that are true to them in the way that it is. And there's also that involves a lot of trust. And I don't, I, I don't know how you build trust be, besides having them be able to see what you've done before and they, they sort of understand what they're getting into. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the importance of trust when it comes to interviewing somebody. That's, I think that you have to be motivated by ethics around like, how, what do you, do you want to portray your guests as they are or as they presented themselves to you or whatever would get the best clicks. Right. And so for me, I, I am connected. I'm grounded in the humanity of my guests. So that is how I, I like navigate those ethics. Like what on a human level, is this okay to do? I don't want to present mistruths. I don't want to edit just for laughs and it's like not really accurate. So that's something that I really abide by. And I think that's how I gain trust. Yeah, I think that's how I gain trust. But I think more than that, it's just like talking to them and like offering elements of myself in conversation. So it's like, if they feel uncomfortable, it's like, yeah, here, let's go down this uncomfortable road. I don't have an answer either. Um, this is this is my experience. Who's somebody you would love to interview you who hasn't yet? someone I would love to interview me. Mm -hmm. So as an interviewer, I actually hate being interviewed. I'm going to be honest. I thought I don't want to talk about myself um, at all. So all of my favorite interviewers, I would like them to interview me because I want to hang out with them and meet them and see their <laughs> style. Like I would love to just understand like peek behind the curtain of Oprah Winfrey or of Howard Stern I would love that but I wouldn't want to be on the other side of their interrogation because I don't want to be th this star <laughs> in that space like I don't prefer that I'm more of a listener than I am a talker believe it or not well that means a lot to me and makes me even more thrilled to have gotten to talk to you so Z-Way thank you so much for talking with me Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I had such a great time. Z-Way's book, Black Friend Essays, will be out on October 17th. After the break, the great Gail King on our infamous 2019 interview with singer and now convicted sex offender R. Kelly. What I was worried about is that he would accidentally hit me when he was hitting his fist. And I'm thinking, God, that, that could hurt. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Be right back. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. We saved the interviewer with the longest tenure and the one with a deep Connecticut connection for last. Broadcast legend Gail King is the co-host of CBS This Morning and editor-at-large of O, the Oprah magazine. In 2019, she curated the book Note to Self, inspiring words from inspiring people. And as longtime Connecticut residents know, she was in front of the camera at WFSB in Hartford for 18 years, starting in 1981. Gail King, Eyewitness News. All right, you know what's coming. Let's go back to little kid Gail King. How much was she just like the person we know and very much love today? I was in uh, elementary school. I lived in Turkey, and I got a note home from the teacher that said, Dear Mr. and Mrs. King, Gail is a, a very bright child, but she talks a lot in class and tends to be disruptive. To me, in my house, getting a note home from the teacher was the worst thing that could happen. So I was always told as a kid, Kion, that you're a nosy child, which I never liked that. I prefer the word curious or inquisitive. So I was definitely that. Was I interviewing people? No. But I am told I ask a lot of questions. Now, when I get in the zone before interviewing somebody, you know, of course, I've, I've done a ton of prep. My, my amazing producing team has done a bunch of research. And so it's definitely collaborative. But there are some conversations I go into and I think to some degree, I don't want to know. I want to go in a little bit dumb. Will you talk about what your favorite kind of going into an interview is in that sense? Well, I always want to know as much as possible. And then you can because... You, when you know as much as possible and you've looked at old interviews, you see what resonates with people, what doesn't, what leads, where they're more open to talk about things and then others. And the reason why I always like to either read the book or watch the movie is because I'll see a little nugget. I'm This is what me. I'm always looking for a little nugget of something. 
for instance, I wish I could remember the author because it was such a good moment that I had with him. He was saying that when his baby was born, he was listening to Bruce Springsteen. And I said, but you never said what Bruce Springsteen song. And he goes, I can't believe that you even know that. Now, the producers, as you know, you're well prepared. You know, it. you know, they've read, they've read the book. They have all these notes, but nobody had pointed that out. And to me, it's just a small thing, but it just gives some insight into who this person is. We just had a thing uh, just yesterday. People were coming on. They have a podcast where they're talking about famous Latinx people. And, you know, it was Jennifer Lopez and Bad Bunny, blah, 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 had all these sorts of notes. Well, when I listened to the podcast, I heard them say Bad Bunny six years ago was bagging groceries. And now he's this mega superstar. And I thought, why isn't that in the note? So the first thing I said, I can't believe Bad Bunny. Was, and then when I got off the air, people said, I didn't know Bad Bunny was begging, was bagging groceries. That's such a good little nugget. and leads to great conversation. So that's why I prepare, prepare, prepare. And sometimes I think you can be overly prepared, too, because someone's telling a story and you go, no, you forgot the part where. <laughs> <laughs> Because this show, Audacious, we often have some really difficult, tender conversations uh, about very personal things. Yes. And I wonder when you are in a position to speak with somebody who's been through something difficult, how you approach the threshold of pushing them harder, if that's the right word, or asking more questions to get deeper. How do you feel that out when it's... Well, you just said it right there. You feel it out. I mean, I believe any question can be asked. You just have to have the right time, the right tone, and the right place. So if you're live on television and you've got 30 seconds left, it's not the time to say, well, when you got picked up for prostitution, what were you thinking? You know, that's what I mean. I also think I'm never a, a gotcha type person, even if it's something that's uncomfortable or embarrassing. I always look at it as I'm trying to give you a platform and a space to tell your story the way you want to tell it. You also have to be prepared if the person isn't, you know, telling the whole truth to say, well, that's not how I heard it. That's not what I read. Uh, can you clear this up? Because sometimes you, you, no one wants to be bullshitted, nobody. So you have to be prepared enough to know exactly who you're talking to. But I think I'm giving you the floor and you decide what you want to share. Now, when it's a very sensitive situation, I think you can do some follow-ups, but I don't want to cause people pain. And the truth of the matter is they don't have to talk about it if they don't want to. So I'm very mindful of that. It's interesting because some people, when they've been through stuff, a, a tragedy, they want to talk about it. Other people don't. And you have to gauge where they are on that. When I think about in your 40 plus year career, the variety of people. That always blows me away when I hear 40 plus years. What? what? Really? How? That sounds like an old person. <laughs> I, had an, I had an intern once say to me, oh, Kion Wolf, I grew up listening to you. And it was a. Oh, no, no, no. I get that all the time. Especially in Connecticut, people will say to me, you know what, Gil, you came to my class when I was in third grade. This is my daughter. She's in third grade. You go, oh, good. Good to see you. I went to CVS the other day. And, you know, when you're picking up a uh, prescription, they always say date of birth, you know, to make sure it's the right person. So I said 12, 28, 54. And they went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it wasn't rude. They were just like, wow. I mean, on the one hand, glad to be still here. And on the other, woo. Oh, no, absolutely. Listen, Walter Cronkite had to retire at 65. I'm sitting here at 68, not even kind of thinking about retiring. So I don't try to hide my age or try to mumble into it. Or, you know, I am so proud to be doing what I'm doing at this stage of my life. I'm so proud to wake up in the morning and be able to stand up off the toilet and not go, oh, you know, I, I may have to hold on when I get up out of a chair, but I, because I got bad knees. But I'm so proud to be doing what I what I really love to do, where I'm doing it. When you are talking to human beings um, who've done something that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm feeling, thinking about um, R. Kelly. When I think about that interview, I think how you remained composed. And while he, you had said that you want the person to be able to tell their own story and you want to be able to help them tell their own story. And you were offering that to him as well. But we now know, and you probably knew during the interview, that so much of what he was saying was were lies. 
and manipulations. Well, I believe those women. I saw that documentary, Surviving R. Kelly, and I believe the women. And so I, I was not expecting him, that interview, to go off the rails the way it did because he went from zero to 200 in a nanosecond. I did not see that coming. And I was able to stay composed because I wasn't afraid. I did not think that R. Kelly, and I didn't know him, I did not think that he wanted to hurt me. I didn't think that, nor did I think he was being theatrical. I do think that it was the first time that he had actually sat down for an interview after that very damning documentary aired, and he wanted to clear his name. So the next day, Khan, I actually called to check on him. And do you know, I was told that he wanted to thank me because people got to see his passion and his pain. And he wanted to thank me for that. And I'm thinking, is that what he saw in that interview? But people said, how could you stay so calm? I wasn't afraid. What I was worried about is that he would accidentally hit me when he was hitting his fist. And I'm thinking, God, that, that could hurt. So I was worried about that. But I didn't think that he meant me any harm. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this I gave y'all 30 years of my career. Robert. 30 years of my career. Y'all trying to kill me. Now, if that had happened to me when I was a baby reporter, I would I would have totally freaked out. Totally. So I'm not saying I'm this, you know, I got it all together. But because it had come, I've done so many interviews. And, and I'd seen interviews with him that when he gets angry, he gets up and walks away. And I was thinking, if I tried to comfort him, wait, wait a second. I know he would have just bam, and left. So I knew, let me just sit here. And I looked up at the chair, looked at him, looked at the chair, looked at the chair, looked at him, looked up, looked down. So he knew I wasn't leaving. And it was sort of like, whatever this is doing right here, I'm going to be sitting here. And I actually think that calmed him down a bit. Can you imagine if I responded the way he did? We'd have both gone off the rails. I'd have a few other questions for you in this interview. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you do look at those monitors on all around you at all times and you're hearing the news, you're hearing a lot of different voices who are interviewers now. You're hearing a lot of black from a lot of black people, brown people, indigenous people, and more and more and more. And it's exciting. You've seen this evolution over your career. How do you feel about representation amongst journalists, amongst interviewers? Well, I just know that that matters. I mean, you have to have diverse voices in key positions because we live in a very diverse country. And if you don't have diverse voices at the table, there are some stories that just won't be told because they're not viewed through the same lens. So I, I know representation matters. I know that. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my own job, you know, where you could raise a point that people go, oh, you know, I hadn't thought of it like that before. I had no idea. In your conversation with Brooke Shields on Now What, you said somebody of color will make a mistake and they're instantly dismissed. Yeah. Someone who's not of color will make a mistake and they'll go, well, they're having a bad day. They'll get another chance. That's true. Do you think there's been any evolution on that? There's been some, but certainly not enough. It's still an industry dominated by white men. So, yeah, sure, there's been some, but no, definitely not. I do feel that we have to work harder. I mean, I just did Michelle Obama, did an interview with her, and she said in the White House, we knew we could not make mistakes. We knew that. Imagine having to live under that banner. And it is true. You know, you, I think sometimes you have to work harder, just as hard, just to get less sometimes. But, you know, early on in my career, when I was a baby reporter, I was in Kansas City. Jesse Jackson came to town. And I did an interview with him. And he could tell I was quite green. He, he was asking me about my career and da da da. I said, well, you know, actually, this is my first job on camera. And he said, well, let me tell you something, Dr. King. He called everybody doctor. Dr. King, excellence is the best deterrent to racism, so be excellent. And I've never forgotten that. I'm going to give, I'm going to make it really hard for you to let me go because I'm not good at my job or I didn't do it well. So I'm going to try to make that very, very hard. Now, you can dismiss me for other reasons, but it's not going to be because I didn't work hard and didn't do a good job. But I've never forgotten that he said that. Was there ever an interview where at the end of it you thought, I'll never be the same after this? Well, Newtown. Newtown was a game changer for me. Um, because I had anchored the news in Connecticut for so many years, I felt 
intimately involved with that story. Now, it would have been a heartbreaking story no matter where it was in the country. But because I, of course, knew the town, knew the interstates, and knew it, it just, and just the thought of these little children who were sitting in their chairs with their baby teeth, you know, they were five years old, five, six years old. I, I just couldn't get that out of my head. And school is supposed to be a really, really safe place. So the trauma and the drama of that uh, was debilitating. So no, that's one I could not get out of my head and still can't get out of my head. I'll always remember December 14th, always. You published a book, Note to Self, Inspiring Words from Inspiring People, back in 2019. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to say I wrote a book. I always say this to the, you know, CBS, we have a franchise here called Note to Self, which is one of my favorite things that we do, where people who are famous or well-known will write a note to, if they were younger, what they would have said. And so they had asked me to go through some of the Note to Self and pull some that I thought were good. So whenever I see... Gail King author, I just, oof, <laughs> it's a little bit. I know my name is on it. Um, I just curated some of the stories. But yeah, it, it did very well because everybody has a story to tell. Everybody, everybody. And everybody is going through something. Everybody. And I thought, you know, some of the stories stand out more than others. But everybody, everybody's got something, Kion, everybody. So I wonder, when you think about question asking seven-year-old Dr. Gail King. Yeah, I know. What would your post-it note to yourself be? Be fearless. Take chances. I'm not saying you take foolish risks. I'm, I'm not out there trying to risk my life about anything, but I think in life sometimes we have to take chances about things we believe in. And most of the times I saw years ago on the Oprah show, 99.9% .9 of things that we worry about actually turn out to work out. And if you think back in your own life, you know, for me, it was I didn't get, uh, I didn't make drill team and I was devastated in high school. How could this be? And my best friend did, or I failed my driver's test the first time. How could this be? This is so embarrassing because I was supposed to drive everybody to the game tonight. The things that you just thought were so devastating, your marriage breaking up. Oh my God, how am I going to, da, 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 da. everything tends to work out. And I see this in my own life time and time and time again. Well, Gail King, thank you so much for speaking with me and for sharing your excellence. Deeply appreciate it. We miss you in Connecticut. It's very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. And thank you so much. Now, it is true that interviewers love to listen, but turns out we also really love to talk. So there's an extended version of this episode on your podcast feed featuring so much good stuff that we couldn't fit into this radio broadcast, including the one crowd that Mehdi Hassan was terrified to speak in front of, what Ziwei really thinks when someone says they're afraid of her, and in the eternal intensity of working in the news industry, how does Gail King take care of herself? I don't do anything. It's not like I'm going to go out and run. It's not like because I hate exercise, but I do. <laughs> You can hear that extended episode at ctpublic.org slash audacious, or it's right there waiting for you in your favorite podcast app. Audacious is always lovingly produced by Khalil Rahman, Jessica Severin D. Martinez, Meg Fitzgerald, Meg Dalton, and Katie Talarski at Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford with help from our courageous interns, Letitia Peters and Joey Morgan. Stay in touch with me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Kion Wolf, and you can always send an email to audacious at ctpublic.org. Thanks for listening. <laughs>